Okay, good morning, everybody. Um, this morning we uh, we have uh, Dr. Nikki Brown here from Penn State, and so she is um, actually going to be heading up the talks on these three different aspects of wood with regard to it being an adhesive or at least the chemical aspects of wood, not, not wood being an adhesive, but how it adhesives interact with it and then also its chemical properties. And so, um, uh, also I wanted to say that um, uh, she's, she's, she does a fine job of public speaking, but she's very soft-spoken. And being that we're all woodworkers and probably haven't been wearing our ear protection properly, <laughs> Uh, I'm going to mic her, okay? So, um, so you're going to do three talks. Uh, we might end up combining them, right? Yeah, and, flexible. And uh, so we want it to be interactive. So if you have questions, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. All right. You ready? All right. Are you all awake? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. All right. Jeez. Did you guys, did you get the right coffee? Yeah. I almost I got, got the, the wrong decaf. one. I didn't realize that one was decaf. The sign was small. Yeah, the sign was very small. Okay. <laughs> All right, thanks, Keith. So I'll just put that in the pocket. Okay. That shouldn't interrupt with. Okay. Okay. All right, we'll see how this goes. I've got all kinds of wires. <laughs> um, I'm happy to be here today with all of you to, and uh, tell you a little bit about some things that we're doing at Penn State. I know Dr. Heineman spoke with you yesterday a little bit about our department and our program. Um, my job today is to tell you a little bit more about the, the new major we developed, and some of you might be familiar with the Penn State Wood Products program that we used to have. That has evolved and transitioned into our new program in biorenewable systems. So that'll be my first um, talk today, is just telling you more about our new major. Um, that one is a little less interactive, but if you do have questions, please, by all means, stop me and ask. Um, and then we'll, talk, we'll move on and talk about adhesives and surfaces, and I have a little bit more interactive stuff to show you guys with that. So first, again, I'm sure Dr. Heineman talked about this yesterday, but um, I wanted to cover it because our department is really very unique. Um, when you look at Penn State, there's a bunch of different colleges that are under central leadership, and the two that we're related to are the College of Ag Sciences and the College of Engineering. Our department is unique because it's the only department that's affiliated with both of those um, colleges. So we have these, these four programs, um, academic programs within the department. Two of those are affiliated in red with the College of Engineering, and then two of them are affiliated with the College of Ag Science. Um, and of course, the ones I'm going to be talking with you about today are BRS, which is Biorenewable Systems. Um, we do also offer engineering grad programs in biological engineering and agricultural and biological engineering at the grad level. So why did, first of all, why did we come up with this name, Biorenewable Systems? Um, the reason, there's a couple reasons, but the first one is that that name embraces a really broad resource base. Our program used to focus just on wood, um, and that was very limiting for students. There's a lot of new and excitement um, funding available to, to look at other agricultural fibers and feedstocks. So we, brought, we felt that this name broadened our scope a bit beyond wood. Um, so here you can see the types of things. This is just an example of what we want to include in our new program. Of course, we see wood-based materials as being the um, cornerstone of this major because most industrial bio-based products are still wood, um, made from a wood feedstock. So wood is, a, is still a very important um, tenant in our program. Um, the other reason we like it is it includes both traditional bio-based materials and ag technologies. So you see some things here. And again, we're, really, we're going from resource base all the way to products with this major. So you see some traditional um, products and technologies. And we also are including some emerging applications, so bio-based energy, bioproducts, and beyond. So here you see pellets, um, packing peanuts that are made from like a starch feedstock, so they actually, you put them in water and they just dissolve. Have you guys seen those? Really neat, not a petrochemical feedstock anymore. Um, the plant-based packaging for bottles, where um, Coke and Pepsi are looking to replace traditional petrochemical-based polymers with plant-based plastics. 
And then of course there's a lot um, going on with biofuels, not only the fuel itself, but the, the um, byproducts, which typically are driving the economics of these biorefineries. So that, that's why we chose that name, biorenewable. Um, the second part of our name is systems. Why do we choose this name, systems? A few reasons for that. Um, mostly because the products themselves, as you all know, don't exist in a vacuum. You're, you're a part of some kind of system level thinking. Um, it implies decision making and management practices are complex and there's many considerations for them. And it also tells you we're not only thinking about science, technology, but we're also thinking about social aspects like business and communication skills. So we've got this feedstock, biorenewable, all kinds of biorenewable feedstocks, and then we're also thinking about um, systems relating to those systems involving business, social sciences, um, technology. We also wanted to consider the life cycle aspects of these things. Um, every single product, of course, has a life cycle associated with it where you're thinking about cradle to grave, the, the ramifications on the environment, on the economics, uh, on the processing, on the transportation of your materials. Um, so we're also considering aspects of the life cycle uh, within our major relative to all these products and technologies. So that's a little bit about why we chose that seemingly odd name. We've gotten a lot of um, consternation, like what does that even mean, biorenewable systems? Well, hopefully now that gives you a little bit better idea of why we um, chose this name. So a few more slides just about the major, and then I'd like to just welcome any questions that you have. Um, the major is an undergraduate major. It's a Bachelor of Science degree, which typically takes four to five years for our students. Um, there's two options. One is ag systems management, and the second one is bioproducts. Okay? The ag systems management piece focuses more on um, agricultural feedstocks and resources, and also the technologies that go along with that. So um, equipment, um, we have a lot of support from manufacturers, uh, you know, John Deere, Case New Holland. Um, they're heavily involved in our program. They donate lots of machinery for our students to take apart, put back together. Um, the students, a lot of them major, or excuse me, minor in an off-road equipment option where they're um, doing a lot of things, thinking about engine design, how pumps work, fluid flow, um, all kinds of things like that. So our students in that option tend to be really hands-on and really interested in machinery and how machinery works. Um, the second option is bioproducts, and this is really where the wood products program has evolved to. And again, we wanted to embrace just a little bit broader name, but you can see traditional feedstocks to newer composites to these new plastics. So um, where ASM typically focuses on the resource and the technologies associated with cultivating and harvesting the resource, the bioproducts option really picks up after the harvesting of those materials and how we convert it and transform it into um, a range of products for society. So what, what do students in, the, in this program have to take? Um, this is kind of small, but really what we try to tell students is um, what's great about our program is you get to do s several different things. You're not stuck within one uh, industry or one set of classes. We have classes in what we call engineering technology, classes in science and industry, and then classes in business and <coughs> communication. So uh, for the engineering technology side, we have a class about basic engineering principles, one, uh, one class solely dedicated to engineering design. Um, a class about energy analysis, another class about safety and health, um, electric power and instrumentation, so they're learning how instrumentation works, um, and then systems management. So again, that systems level thinking about how, how do things work together? What, what are the net impacts of making a decision as a manager? For the science and industry piece, we have um, biorenewable products, so we cover all kinds of products that are made. We talk about marketing and sales of biorenewable materials. Um, we, dis we just are starting an industry tour, and this is something I'll mention again in a few minutes, because I think this is a way we might be able to engage a lot of you guys, um, at least who are within a drivable distance from Penn State. Um, colloquium, again, another opportunity for industry interaction with our students. 
and then we, we require them to take a little bit, one semester each of chemistry, biology, and physics. So they're well-rounded um, in scientific disciplines. And then the last piece, of course, very important in the real world, business and communication skills. So they take two classes in economics, two in ag business management. Um, they have writing and speaking skills for specific to this industry, and that's two classes in that. Um, two classes in English and then a communications class. So that gives you an idea of what our program is like. Um, we also require the students to take 12 to 15 credits in a specialization area. And again, a lot of those students in ASM like to do the off-road equipment um, minor as their specialization. We also encourage people to take more business, um, more materials science, more chemistry, um, depending on their strengths. That, that specialization could be very broad. So for those of you who were familiar with the Old Wood Products program, I just wanted to highlight some differences that we have with the new program. Um, the main option that we had for our Old Wood Products WP was the Business and Marketing program. And um, that required, I'm just gonna go through and kind of do a side-by-side -side comparison of the requirements. So it required two calculus courses. Our new BRS major really only requires one. Um, and that's because our students just were not using the math. And, no one really wanted to take two semesters if they weren't going to use it. Um, so we, we bumped that down to one. The wood products previously didn't have that science base. There wasn't um, official requirements in chemistry, physics, or biology. But we find that students need at least a fundamental understanding of some of those principles. So now we're requiring one semester each of chemistry, physics, and biology. Before, we didn't have them taking anything about electric um, power or instrumentation and now um, based on industry feedback and based on faculty discussions we think that's really important and really valuable for our students so they are taking a class in that. Um, there was no industry tour now we've implemented this week-long industry tour for our students where we'll be going around to industry and um, touring your facilities and interacting uh, with you for a week um, just a dedicated course to see industry there was no engineering de design, and now we have an engineering design course. Again, getting students to think about um, how engineers think when they're making designs so that they can uh, interact with them productively at the job site. And then there was, we did have, of course, a lot more credits uh, in the old wood products program to focus on principles of wood science like um, and, and wood ID, so tree ID, dendrology, wood ID, those were things that we used to be able to offer. In this transition, we've eliminated that as a formal requirement. However, students can still use their specialization credits to take dendrology. Um, and the wood ID component is just much more minimal because something had to go in this transition and that was some of the stuff that um, dropped off. Based on industry feedback, we have considered adding a wood minor so students could get some of those fundamentals of wood science back um, for students who really want to specialize in the wood industry. So partnering with industry is really very important to us. Um, we have an industry advisory committee. Well, it's, it's just broader than industry. We, we're inviting people from industry to participate. Uh, but this is our first advisory committee meeting, which took place fall a year ago. Um, and you recognize Keith up there. I told Keith I put his picture in the presentation. Um, so what these guys do is they come and they see our program um, firsthand and they give feedback to us about what they think is working, what we can improve, um, what kind of suggestions they can make. They're also, their role is to be kind of a liaison to the, to the broader industry as well. So if you had questions about what we're doing or what's working or what's not working, the people on this advisory board are great contacts for you. And so Keith is um, one of the people that we've targeted for that. And we're grateful to have you, Keith, on board. Um, we also, of course, value the job connection. Um, you know, we've been told time and time again that you guys like to hire our students, which is wonderful. Um, we hope that that continues with the new program. And um, internships and permanent placement are things that we want to be able to facilitate with you guys. Um, there's also a lot of opportunities for um, gifts, scholarships to uh, impact students. Um, that would be great. A number of you are already doing that. And then there's opportunities for research collaboration. So, um, 
I don't know, did you talk yesterday, Paul, about the different faculty and what we all do? So you got an idea yesterday of what kinds of expertise are there at Penn State. And if you have interest or you have a project, um, there's a lot of different ways that that can be handled um, at Penn State, but we like to work on things that are relevant to industry that make a difference. Uh, so that kind of gives you an idea of just very briefly, our program in biorenewable systems. Um, I'd love to take questions from you guys if there's anything that um, you've been just longing to ask about uh, this transition from wood products to BRS, for those of you familiar with our program, or for those of you who hadn't, aren't familiar with it, if you just have broader questions about what we're doing at Penn State, I'd like to open it up for some questions. Yeah, Nikki brought up internships, which I'm glad she did. Uh, one of the ways that we can really connect is through internships, and, and you know, it's a, it's not a complicated thing. If you would like to hire a student during the summer who's interested in your uh, your discipline, your industry, um, or you want to expose our students to your industry, it's a great way to do it. And you know, the internships are, the, the obligate, it's, it's, it's a non-commitment, non-long-term commitment. So, you know, for one summer to, to provide that opportunity, um, you don't even, I mean, I guess, as I said, Keith said that maybe some people think that they have to provide housing, all this, and that's not really what it's about. It's just, you know, if you have a job, you want to bring a student in to help out uh, at any level, we'd like to have it more than just, you know, cleaning up a shop or something, mm -hmm. but uh, a good experience for them, but they can also help you. Um, it, it, you know, the, the students can find their own housing and all that, but it, it, typically they'd like to pay, of course. They're looking for pay opportunities. Um, but this is a great way to get the, the students exposed to the industry. It isn't just the tours, that's one way, but for them to really get a feel if this is the kind of thing they'd like to do, and they can come back and tell their fellow students, uh, hey, you know, hopefully they come back and say this was a great experience, that's a direction I'd like to go. Um, the, it's an easy thing to do if, if you have an interest, and, and I'm going to speak for us at Penn State, typically our students are, you know, we're, they're going to go around the northeast, maybe not out west, but some of them will. But contact any program that's related at, at any university in your area, um, and and put this out there. All I need, if you're from the Pennsylvania area or the northeast, just send me a note, and uh, or Nikki, mm -hmm. Nikki by the way is the, the coordinator for the bioproducts option, and uh, just saying, hey, we'd like to have an internship. We can work with you. You can come to campus and visit with students or or whatever. Um, it's it's very simple. So just a job description and a contact is often all we need. Mm -hmm. I will tell you, the best time of year to do that, though, is the mid to late fall. Mm -hmm. uh, by spring, especially mid-spring, uh, we still get people contact us saying, hey, you know, I've got an internship. And the students have found everything. You know, they found the jobs for the summer already. Mm -hmm. So the best time is mid to late fall to set something up for the following summer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just to piggyback on that, we have a class um, in the spring semester, if we know that you're interested, we welcome industry to come in and talk about, talk with our students about what you guys do, what you make, what's your industry sector, um, what does the market look like, and then often what people will do is we'll set up a room and you can just interview students right after your presentation for either permanent placement or internships. So that's something that we do um, related to our colloquium class, which is held every spring. Um, so if you're interested in that, let us know because we can get you on the schedule for colloquium if you're available to come to Penn State. Other questions? Yeah. One thing I guess we offer leadership classes. Oh, do you like that? Um, so. Three ninety two. Oh, okay, right. So, yeah, I mentioned that we have a two-series class on communications that's specific to our industry. And that is true, um, but one side of that focuses more on communication. And Paul reminded me that the other end of that class, there's two classes, focuses more on leadership. 
Um, so we are training students in leadership. We also encourage them to take a class um, in entrepreneurship, so they're thinking um, that way about how to be innovative. And, and we also want to give them some training on some of the legal aspects related to that. You know, what are what is an NDA? What you know, what are all these things mean? So they're not just broadsided when they come to you. Hopefully, they'll know at least you know what those things are. Okay, so. Um, to keep you guys on schedule, I'm going to get started with the next talk. So I've been asked to talk about two different things. One is surfaces, and a little bit about surface chemistry. And the other one is about adhesion. Um, so I'm going to start with the surface chemistry stuff. And um, like I said, I'm going to try to make it interactive. So some of you guys, I may pick on some of you guys and have you come up and uh, volunteer. So whenever I talk about surfaces with my students, um, I start out by talking about surfactants. Because um, surfactants do some really cool things to illustrate surface science. So any kind of soap would be a surfactant. Um, and the thing that's interesting about surfactants is by their very nature, um, their part, they have an oily part and they have a, a water-loving part. So they're kind of um, bipolar. <laughs> okay. You can think about that in an emotional sense, but really, like in a chemical sense, they're bipolar. Um, so I'm making a little soap solution here, and we're just going to look at the energy, the energetics of different surfaces, and think about <clears throat> what happens at different surfaces. Okay, so let me see if I've got enough surfactant. I do. Okay, so if you're up front, you may be able to see this better, but I'm going um, I'm going to just walk around and have you guys do some of this. So what I have here, I just have these little frames that we made out of um, coat hangers. Okay, so my husband actually, I was telling Keith, my husband is a laser welder guy, but he's a real handy guy too. So he helped me weld these things together. He didn't use his laser this time. Um, so what happens? We're all familiar with this example, right, of a film from kids when we're blowing bubbles. What does the soap solution do on a frame like this? Well, it just covers the surface, right? So if I dip it in my solution, I don't know if you guys can see. Everybody kind of see very that nice. in the light? Okay, so, you know, very, um, very simple. But what happens when we look at increasing complexities? So I have a couple different shapes here. Um, probably the next most complex is this cone shape. Okay, everybody kind of see that? So if it will fit in my cell. Oh. It's too, my bucket is too small. Can you believe that? Um, this doesn't just make a simple film as you might think it would. Okay, let me show you our next most complex shape, which is a pyramid. Okay, so have in your mind what you think the pyramid will do for the soaps, and then you want to do this since we'll make an interactive. Be careful. <laughs> yeah. So let me walk around so people can kind of see that. Yeah, so is that what you expected? No. no. Okay. So actually, this illustrates a principle of organic chemistry that a lot of people have trouble with, which is a tetrahedral carbon, um, what that actually looks like when it bonds. So why does it do this? Um, I, don't worry, I won't, go, I won't go there with too much organic chemistry. Um, why does it do that? Why does it make that shape? Everybody see how that... Does that? Why doesn't it just coat the uh, individual edges of the frame? Any ideas? Bonds to each other. Shortest distance it takes. Yeah. Good. So something about a minimum, right? Can you guys see? Sometimes when I get bubbles, it doesn't do. Everybody see that? Okay. So kind of different than what you might have expected. Um, it's, it's because this is the minimum surface area configuration. Okay, so the point of this being, it, and surfaces are very high energy places for molecules to be. Nothing wants to be at a surface. Okay, so liquids are very mobile, so they will arrange themselves to have the minimum surface area that they can. Okay, so I love the triangle one. It's really, um, that's my favorite. Um, this is a cube, okay, so I'll walk around and show you guys. You want to try this one? Oh, Leon? goody. <laughs> uh, I was hoping for a turn. <laughs> wow. Okay, so I'll walk around so you guys can see this one, okay? Everybody see that? 
So pretty neat. So this is also a good science fair. You know, if you're looking for kids science fair stuff, you can do stuff with surfactants and soap foams. Um, so again, this is the minimum surface area because surfaces are very high energy. So nothing wants to be at the surface. Okay, so the molecules organize themselves to make the minimum contact with the surface that they can. Okay, so um, the students really like this one, so hopefully, hope you guys enjoyed it too. Keith told me, don't just stand up there and just do PowerPoint. <laughs> we try not to do that at Penn State, but um, so everybody saw that. Okay, good. So there's some other shapes that you can play around with. Um, but those are the cool ones. Now to illustrate that point a little bit further, um, this is just another one that's kind of cool because it makes a curved interface. I don't know if you guys can see that. You're welcome to come up after and play around with these if you want. Um, the other point to make though, so hopefully the main thing we got from that is surfaces are very high energy, okay? So we don't want to create a lot of area, fresh surface area because the molecules at that surface almost pay a penalty. It's a very unstable place. They're not happy to be there. They want to go back into a bulk. They don't want to be exposed to the surface. It's very high energy. So to illustrate that a little bit further, I have this little frame. Um, so there's just a copper wire. For those of you in the back, I know that's hard to see, but there's a little copper wire that slides along the frame. Okay. So what hap what's going to happen when I put this in the soap solution? If I extend it, what happens if I extend it? Draw back. Very good. It'll draw right back because the, the molecules want to be in the bulk. They don't want to be extended into the surface because that's high energy. Okay, so if I make a film and release it, it should go back. Okay, so let's see. Oh, I might need more soap on this. My stuff got a little rusty. Everybody's asking me, what are you doing with that steel wool up there? So let's see. Okay, it's there. All right, so did you see that? Cool. Isn't that cool? That is cool. Um, so I'll pass this around so you guys can play with it. Um, it's really, it's kind of hard. Let me put a little bit more soap in. But you get the idea. So again, surfaces want, it's a high energy place. Molecules want to be in the bulk, so they'll, they will go try to get there as any way they can. Now liquids have an advantage because they're very mobile, right? So what the heck does this mean for wood is the question that we're gonna think about today. Um, what is happening at the wood surface and what opportunities are there for wood to lower its surface energy? Okay, so that's what we'll think about. But let me get this right so I can pass it around for you guys to play with. Okay, good. So there it is. You'll get a little messy if you want to do that, but I'll pass it around. Um, you have nice, clean hands. Um, yeah, so let's think about what is at the wood surface. Um, so before, before I go there, I just wanted to show you some images of wood. Um, so at Universities, we, can, we have a lot of electron microscopes where we can take some really cool high-res images of what wood looks like. Who can give me the species of this? <laughs> yeah, sugar maple, right? But what were the, you could see that, right? It's diffuse porous, obviously, so it's a hardwood, okay? And maple is a common diffuse porous, although there's many others. Um, so look at what we're looking at here, okay? There's different pressure depths um, with a fixed oblique knife cutting system. And you can see um, for low pressure and then high pressure, the differences in the surface that are left after you've cut wood, okay? What do you notice about that surface? Pretty rough. Very good, we'll talk about that in adhesion. A lot of people have the belief that you always need to roughen a wood surface. If it's a freshly machined surface, typically you have adequate roughness there to get a good bond. Even in the one at high pressure, there's, it's not a very uniform surface. It would feel very smooth to you, but when you look at it um, like an adhesive or resin sees it, there's, it's kind of a little jumbled, okay? It's not very smooth. Um, so that's what things look like at the wood surface. I'll show you a couple more. This one's neat because it's a milling, um, after milling, 
What do you notice about the surface here, about the cells at the very surface? Yeah, they're kind of compressed, kind of crushed, okay? And a lot of the things we're talking about here for surface chemistry relate directly to what kinds of problems we might face when we start thinking about adhesion. So what kinds of issues here might you have trouble with if you're using um, milling speeds that are um, not, not optimum? What do you notice about that surface that might be a problem for an adhesive? Good, so you, you don't have a place for your adhesive to get in anymore. You've kind of compacted the surface, you've blocked those holes. Um, you might have also very significantly changed some of the energetics of the surface by these milling techniques. Okay, good. And here's just one more that you can see. Um, this is helical planing. So after planing, what does the surface look like? Um, so again, you see a lot of roughness there in the surface. A lot of people are surprised by this because if you were to feel these surfaces again, they feel very, very smooth. But it, you know, when you look a little closer, there's a lot of variation. Yes, question. What magnification is that? Um, good question. So this, on each of these images, there's actually a scale bar. So this bar is 100 microns. Mm -hmm. So typically, you know, the vessels are a very large opening, but the cells, you know, cell lumens 20 to 40 to 60 microns, depending, early wood, late wood, um, things like that. Nikki, yes? To the left of that, is that the magnification? Looks like times um, 200. Is that not right? Yes, you're right, Paul. Times 200, and this is just the accelerating voltage when you hit the surface with electrons. Yes, question? The relationship between a micron and a thousand for 4,000 for 100. What? 4,000 of an inch for 100, 4, 100. 4, 100. microns. Okay, good. See, it's good to have some people here. <laughs> yeah, we, I tend to be all in metric just because that's what, you know, chemistry, degree C and everything's metric, so very good, very good question. Other questions so far about surfaces, chemistry, wood? Okay, so I just wanted you to see, oh, let me show you the um, transverse image. So these are looking at a plane of the surface that you guys don't typically deal with, right? Um, this is a tangential surface after helical planing and face milling. Okay, so again, you see a lot of roughness. Okay, plenty of surface area for adhesives to grab too. Um, I have seen one case where um, an adhesive surface was um, almost super smooth and that was because the cutting blade was um, going way too fast and it kind of burnished the surface, almost polished it. Um, but in that case, that would be the only case where I would expect a serious problem for adhesion. Most surfaces are definitely rough enough without you having to scrape them up or something. Um, now I'm talking about freshly machined wood surface, not something that has an adhesive or coating system on it. In those cases, yeah, you do need to rough it up to get good adhesion. Okay, so again, let's go back to our soaps. Um, is our frame moving around the room? I hope so. I hope you guys are playing with that somewhere. Um, so wood is not very mobile, right? A liquid we talked about can reconfigure itself to get a low, to go to the bulk. Wood cannot, it is fixed in position. So what can it do um, to respond to this high surface energy? Well, first of all, I just wanted to make the point that the functional groups of wood, that's just a fancy word for the different kinds of chemistries we have in wood. Um, those create lots of surface energy on wood. So it means that wood has a very high energy surface. Okay, um, that means again, it has an energy penalty. Those things on the surface don't want to be there. It's very high energy. So what does that mean when you drop something on it? It'll spread, good. Thank you for whoever said that. So because it's a high energy surface, whatever you drop onto wood typically will spread and wet onto the surface because why? That lowers the barrier of the things that are on the surface. Okay, it gives it something else to interact with. So it's no longer a high surface area, uh, high surface energy, okay? So good, because of wood's high surface energy, almost anything will spread on the surface. Now this is the key point. That thing that can spread on it can be from the atmosphere or from the environment, so something that drops on it. Um, but it can also happen from the wood. There are some mobile things in wood that can come to the surface over time and kind of coat the surface of wood. Um, 
so I wanted to talk to you guys just briefly about those things and about why a fresh surface is good for wood adhesion. So the mobile parts of wood, um, again, there's not much of this, but there's these relatively small compounds called extractives. Um, there's thousands of these things in wood, and they make up about 1 to 5% of wood's mass. It's a lot higher in tropical species where you actually can feel the oils kind of coming out of the wood. But our classical domestic species is about 1 to 5% um, by weight. Um, the important thing, these are, if you soaked these in solvent or wiped them with solvent, these things would come right off, um, depending on the type of solvent you use. It's a very diverse group of compounds. There's tannins, there's um, terpenes, sterols, um, fats and waxes are the ones that we want to think about, though. So what do you guys know about wax on the car, even, even wood finishes? What does that do for a car when you put that wax on? Good. So it's a very low surface energy that you're putting on to um, your car, okay? So that when you drop water on, water will beat up. It wants to stay in the bulk. It doesn't want to spread on that low energy surface. Very good. So it's a very similar thing with wood. Over time, these very mobile compounds that are within the wood can migrate, and they will migrate to the surface of wood. And it actually kind of fouls the surface. It develops an oily coating over time on your wood. And it does just like what the wax does on a car. Not as prolific in that sense um, as a freshly waxed car surface. But uh, we see definite and distinct differences in wood surfaces over time due to this extractive compounds coming to the surface and forming like a waxy coating on the wood. Okay, so that's um, something I teach my students about. And in fact, we do, we do a lab um, where we look at different cases of uh, wood blocks. And I'll show you, uh, show you this one. And then we'll take a break, I think, and have some have some questions. So we, may, we take these wood blocks and we expose them to different um, conditions. So one of them is a finished surface, obviously, going to be what kind of surface energy on this? Low. Low. Very good. Okay. This one has been heat treated over time. Okay. And then we compare that to one that's been outside. Okay. And what I have them do is I have them uh, take a drop of water onto each of these surfaces. So this is, you can use anything to drop water on, but we, we have our syringes. So, um, and I have them get about 10 microliters, but it doesn't matter, you can do whatever. And those of you who are close can see a lot better. But you can actually drop it on and you can watch um, the wetting behavior change. Okay, so what I have them do, I have them drop the water onto wood and then I have them use a digital timer to see how long it takes for the water to wet out on the surface. Um, and, and what we've seen, so the one that was um, heat treated has already, there's a little bit of shine left on the surface, but you get an idea based on how stable that droplet is. Now on our finished surface, it's a nice, it's still a very nice drop that's maintained because the water prefers to stay in the bulk. It doesn't want to spread on that surface, okay? And then our um, exterior exposed wood has definitely wet out very quickly. Then I have them do, compare that with a freshly sanded surface. And the freshly sanded surface, man, it just, as soon as you get the water on there, it has wet and spread out. And that's because when you do a fresh machining or sanding to your surface, you're removing all that surface oil that has built up. Um, so that's definitely the best bonding surface that you can have for your wood components is something that's freshly um, machined or sanded. Okay. So any questions so far on anything that we've talked about with surfaces? Yes? What's the time frame that that wax starts migrating to the top? Is it very personal? Yes, um, it does. It, there's a lot of variables. So <coughs> moisture content will vary, species will vary. Um, so it's, you can notice a difference even after a few days of this migration to the surface. So even something that's been sitting out over a weekend, you know, in your shop, you might notice it's a little bit different on a Monday morning than it might be on a Friday afternoon after it's gone through your process. 
Um, but obviously, the longer it sits there, the more chance you have for buildup. Temperature play a part in that? Absolutely. Temperature does as well. So all the environmental factors that you would expect are important there. Yeah, so Keith. if somebody is preparing wood, wrapping it in plastic to protect it from moisture coming from the atmosphere in, we're not, mm -hmm. we're not understanding that there may be some things happening from the wood itself, and then there's no... There's nothing you can really do about this, wall, right? right? I mean, yeah, there's not a really economical solution to prevent this from happening over time. So it's just something to be aware of in your manufacturing operations that this will happen. Um, that's a good question. So Keith had just asked, what if you wrap your stuff, does that make a difference? And the answer is no, this will happen over time. Question? Is there much difference in the face grain versus edge grain? Yes, um, you know, radial tissues tend to conduct things much more quickly. So if you're looking at a tangential surface, that which is what we typically are looking at, that can be fouled a little bit more quickly than a radial surface of wood. So. Yeah, but there's not hard data. I haven't seen any studies that have really looked at how long this takes to make a significant oh. impact. Definitely depends on the species and how much of these fats and oily compounds that you have in the wood. When, I have one in the back here. Yes? Yeah, I work for a company that manufactures planting equipment. Mm -hmm. Typically, you say a rule of thumb is you're going to do it today, you should have either ripped it this morning or yesterday. Yep. Good, very good point. Right. So the, the comment, if you didn't hear, was if you're going to glue it today, it should have been. Um, machined, or yeah, th that morning or the day before, for this very reason. So, very good. Yeah, I guess my question is going to be if somebody's preparing wood, uh -huh. and uh, for whatever reason they can't, they, they're not going to be able to do it quite that quick, and so they wrap it in plastic to protect it from moisture coming on, mm -hmm. and then in that moisture, in that moisture barrier, the plastic does that raise the temperature up, and does that impact? Uh, making their product even worse than not No, so the question was what if you what's going on really when you wrap your yeah. materials in wood to prevent environmental things from impacting your wood? Mm. First of all, it depends on the plastic too. Um, you know, plastic certain plastics are permeable to the environment. Even you throw something in your Ziploc in the refrigerator and it's gonna go bad. It's not like that's a you know a permanent barrier. Um, but so related to this question, though, about the, the fouling from wood itself, there's, you know, you're not going to make a change there. Are you sealing your environment with humidity, and is that going to impact the wood? This is another great question, um, because typically we'll talk about adhesives a little bit. Um, we don't have a whole lot of time, but I wanted to tell you guys a little bit about <coughs> adhesion science. Um, Typically, though, for adhesives, and I don't know if there's any manufacturer, adhesive manufacturers here, they always love when I say this, but um, you know, 80, upwards of 80% of adhesion-related fails in manufacturing are not due to the adhesive, they're due to environment. So you guys have heard that probably from Lee, if you've interacted with Lee Stover, you know, he and I talk about this all the time. So a lot of people are quick to blame it on the adhesive because you're spending a lot of money on adhesives, and it's an adhesion problem. But typically when you go back and look at it, it's typically a wood problem or an environmental problem because the wood changes so much um, in response to the environmental conditions of temperature and humidity. So good. Yep. Being porous as opposed to say like a maple is one worse than the other in terms of these. Uh, good question. The question was, does it matter the species if you have something ring porous versus something diffuse porous? Do you see more or less of that? It just depends on species. Uh, particular environment, you know, you could have the same species even from tree to tree. We see a lot of heterogeneity in the amounts of these kinds of extractives. So I haven't, I'm not aware of a big difference. Yes? Have you researched the soil content that the tree grew in? Does that have any No, but I really like that question. The question was, have you researched the soil around the trees and does that impact um, this phenomenon in wood? And I, I'm not aware of any studies that have looked at that, but it's a really interesting question. Hmm? Oil spills. Yeah, oil spills. Yeah. <laughs> that might be a problem, huh? Good. <laughs> Good. Is this is a natural reaction for healing? Is that why the wood does that? Um, that's a good question. So extractive compounds initially in the wood do provide some resistance to attack to trees. So you know that trees that have a lot of these extractives tend to be more resistant to decay. 
Um, but a lot of the decay and disease resistant extractives are what we call phenolics. So they're kind of a different class of these extractable compounds than the fats and oils that would migrate um, to the surface. So does that answer the question? Or uh, take, remind me the question again so I can try well, I was to do just better. wondering if it was a healing process. A healing process, right. So um, it's more, it could be involved in healing of the tree, but this is more related to the mobility of these low molecular weight oils and they just naturally diffuse through wood and, and go towards the surface to kind of wet out the surface. So it's not, you know, once you're dealing with the wood and you've machined it out, the tree isn't really alive anymore, so it can't respond is it physiologically. Forced, is it a forest to homogenize? You might have it on the surface, you remove it so the surface doesn't have any more, it wants to go back. Yes, it'll keep going back. It'll try to go back to the surface. Because these are just very small compounds and they're trying to work their way out of the wood. Good. Other questions? Yeah. The capillary action can uh -huh. diffuse through the pores. So right. The pores. That's right. So, again, these are small quantities, so it's not, it doesn't have the advantage of like bulk movement, like a, if you're at above fiber saturation that you would see for water moving through the capillaries. These are really small quantities, but they can you know, network through the wood tissue structure and take advantage of that. So good. Good. Other questions? Yes. So like in soft maple, um, after a panel or something sits for a couple weeks, it starts to yellow. Is that part of that wax? That oil yeah, or? there's, I actually did a study um, a long time ago as an undergrad about like a pinking phenomenon that happens after bonding with PVA, white glues. And some of you guys may be familiar with that. And I think it's related to the type of catalysis that they're using, which is typically an aluminum trichloride um, catalyst to cross-link PVAs. Um, so is it related? Yes and no. There's a couple things that can happen to the surface over time. One is migration of these compounds. The second thing is, remember again, it's a very high energy surface, so anything that can be deposited on it from the atmosphere can be part of that too. So whatever kind of dirt, dust, oils that might be in the air can settle on your surface. Also UV exposure, if it's been exposed to light, you can have oxidation reactions happening. Um, and anytime you develop um, a lot of double bonds into a surface, which can happen with oxidation, you get color um, that you see. So it's probably a combination of extractives and oxidation happening to, for that photo yellowing. And you see the same thing in your newspaper, right? Your, that sits out, you know, it yellows over time. That's an oxidation <coughs> phenomenon in that case. So other questions? So does oxidation inhibit the adhesion also? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, again, oxidation will lower the surface chemistry to some extent, depending on the, it depends on the functional groups that you're getting on your surface, but generally speaking. So what is the best I guess lacquer or solution out there to prevent the yellowing on either a pop or, or a pine piece? That is a great question, and I don't have a good answer for you right off the top of my head. Um, I haven't done much work with trying to eliminate that. Um, typically, people are just trying to do a quick um, bond, you know, to get their good adhesion, and then they're doing some kind of finishing step to get the, to develop the color that they want. So I don't have a good answer for your question about preventing that. Um, there are different kinds of solutions that would inhibit oxidation, but I don't have any practical experience with them. And I don't know if it would make sense, probably not economic, to, for you guys to consider using them. That would be my guess. Good question. When it comes to adhesion, mm -hmm. has there been a study to show how much of a decrease, what's the percentage of decrease of the strength over time? Let's say one day, three days, five days, three days. Very good question. Um, question was, has there been a study to show how much of a percent drop you would see in your bonding um, over time due to this phenomenon of things moving to the surface or things oxidizing? Um, I'm not aware of one that looks at it in a scale of days. I've seen studies where they look at a surface like after 180 days, which isn't very relevant you know, to what you guys are doing in industry. Um, but it, I don't know if any of the machining manufacturers have done anything in the room. No? Okay. So I'm not aware of anything on a practical time scale that might be looking at, you know, days to months. 
Yeah, absolutely. Very good point. It would depend on the species. It would depend on the environmental conditions. Um, depend on a lot of different factors. So very good. OK, well, let's take another quick break. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about adhesion, but I know you guys need to be on the bus. If I can start in like five minutes, and we'll do maybe 15, 20 minutes on adhesion, then we should be good. OK. OK. All right, guys, so we're going to get started on our last session here. So um, I wanted to tell you a little bit about adhesion. And where I'm coming at this from, um, I did my PhD at Virginia Tech and they have a really great adhesion science program at Virginia Tech. So we actually, my project was in conjunction with Franklin, which a lot of you guys are familiar with. Um, I went to Columbus at their R&D facility and learned how to make these. Um, so <laughs> for about four years I studied um, PVA or white glue as typically called and how it works. And my specific um, project for grad school was how, why does this one give a little bit more durability than this one. So um, I have a lot of knowledge <laughs> about that subject if anybody's really curious about it. Um, four or five years worth of making these and testing them. So, um, so that's that. So for adhesion, the things that we're talking about are um, really taking two dissimilar things, putting them together, and the goal is to have that thing that you made perform uh, the same as a bulk material when you expose it to a mechanical stress or strain. Okay, so that's the goal of adhesion. Uh, you want it to be able to withstand external stresses and strains to perform like an integrated composite. Why is this important to you guys? Well, we all know that there, you just can't you do bulk stuff anymore with wood. You have to bond together smaller pieces often. So 70% roughly, it's estimated, of wood um, commercial applications are requiring wood bonding. So I'm going to skip, in the interest of time, I was going to have you guys brainstorm all kinds of things that stick and then we would talk about why things stick together. I'm going to skip over that and just kind of go into these different theories of adhesion. Um, so the first one that we'll talk about is this guy. What is this? Uh, this is another one of these electron microscope images. What is that? Anybody have an idea? <laughs> Paul's not allowed to answer. No? What? Pop? What was it? Velcro. Velcro. Yes, that's right. Good job. Um, so that is Velcro. So you see, um, when you zoom in a, in a microscope, you can see that the um, the fuzzy side is those long, long loops. And I actually brought some, so you can take a look at it maybe with uh, fresh eyes. Yeah, so if you look at the side of this, I'll just pass it around in the box, um, you can see that one side looks really fuzzy. That's the side with the long loops that you see, um, the really thin threads, really long loops. And then if you look at the short side, you can actually, if you look closely, you know, get your glasses <laughs> adjusted, right? You can see the little hooks on the other piece, okay? So that's Velcro. So the, how does that work? How do things stick together with by Velcro? Good, it's a mechanical interlock. Things get kind of, it's like a hook into, um, or a nail into a wood, um, you know, mortar and tenon kind of construction. You've got something that actually locks together mechanically. So that's our first theory of adhesion. Now, does anybody know how this was developed? Paul knows, he's not allowed to, <laughs> he's not allowed to give the answer. How was Velcro developed? Plant, good. So some guy in Europe is out hiking, and you know those little cockle burrs that you get when you're hiking? They stick to your socks and stuff? That's how the guy developed Velcro. He took that thing, and he looked at it, and he said, how does this work? It's sticking. Every time I go out hiking, it's sticking to my socks. What is this stuff? And he actually made this from thinking about um, those little cockle burrs. So interesting story. OK, so the first theory is mechanical interlock. So when you look at wood, um, you've got all these nice holes, right? And so the idea is, what if we can pour some liquid into the holes, fill the holes, and then harden it in place? Then we'll have mechanical interlock because you've got one thing locked into another structure, okay? So that's the idea of a mechanical interlock with wood. The important things to remember for this theory has nothing to do with the chemistry. All that you've got to do is have one thing hooked into another. Um, the resin flows into the voids and hardens. 
So what are some things about your resin that might be desirable if you wanted to improve mechanical interlock? What are some things about your resin? Good, viscosity, so how easily it flows. You want that to be high or low? You want it to flow well or not? You want it to flow really well. Very good, so that it can get into those pores as long as it'll harden once it gets in there, right? Okay, so what else? So by the way, how does a resin manufacturer do that probably? How do they give you better flow? Adding water. What's that? Adding water. Adding water, that's one way. Warming Anything else? What's that? Warming it up. Warming it up, good. That's another way that you can do on site. The adhesive manufacturer is probably going to change the molecular weight of your resin a little bit. So they'll give you shorter molecules. Okay? If you think about a plate of spaghetti, or if you think about a daughter or wife who has really long hair, that stuff can get tangled up really easily, right? If you make it a lot shorter, you alleviate this tangling problem. So that's, that's in essence what viscosity is. The longer the molecule is, the more tangled up it is, the harder it is for it to flow. Okay, so your resin manufacturers, if you're having trouble with flow or spread, they may actually go back and look at a way to reduce the molecular weight of the resin that they give you. Okay, but the other ways that you mentioned are also good. Reducing solids, um, heating it up. Good. What about wood factors? What might you do to your wood if you wanted to get better mechanical interlock? To some extent, right? We've talked about that a little bit last time, right? Um, you don't need to rough it up unless... You kind of want to open it up. Very good. How would you open it up? Sharp blades. Sharp. sharp blades. What's that? Just yeah, sharp cuts. Sharp cuts. If you can get away with a different species, sometimes um, some are a little bit easier to bond. Um, what are some classic woods that are really hard to bond? Mahogany. Good. So some, you're giving me some tropicals. That's good. The tropicals, the reason they're hard to bond is twofold. One is the oils on there, but the other is the density, right, of the wood itself. What's another one? Eucalyptus. What's that? Eucalyptus. Eucalyptus. Good. Hickory. Hickory. Okay, good. I was hoping somebody would give me a, um, a like a southern yellow pine with those tran really sharp transitions between early wood and late wood. Right? So the late wood cells, where you see the grain, circles of grain or growth patterns in yellow pine, those cells are really dense and the opening in the cell is really small. So it's really hard to get resin, even resin penetration into a southern yellow pine species or something with a very distinct early wood, late wood transition. Those are hard to bond. So again, thinking about these issues for how do you get the resin in, how do you get it to lock in place. Um, those are things that you want to think about when you're doing um, mechanical interlock. So what do you guys use for hardening your resin? Time. time. Very good. Time. What else? There's some other ways you can get your resin to harden up so it stays a lot. Good. Radio frequency. So that gives you energy uh, in the system so it can actually cross link or tie network within your wood. So that hardens it. Very good. Some people might use a um, catalyst with their system as well, which does a very similar thing. It builds connections in the resin. Good. Okay, so that's mechanical interlocks. There's, only, there's four more of these that we'll go through and think about um, how they impact adhesion. We already talked about the surface, um, the surface preparation issues. This is just another one of helical planing. So you can see, again, um, with additional pressure during the planing, you get a really rough surface that's possible. You don't, you don't want this down here. You, you're fine up here. There's enough void structure there to get good bonding. So you don't need to tear up the surface so much unless you're dealing with something very, very difficult to bond. Okay, so we'll skip that. So the second one, what are we looking at here? Second theory of adhesion. This is the classic example of this guy. Any plumbers? Weekend plumbers? Good. If you have to. <laughs> That's what my husband says too. If I have to. Um, these are PVC piping. Okay. So, um, so what do you do when, you, when you're doing plumbing? Good. Prime it. Very good. So what is that actually doing? Cleans it some. Good. Opens it up some. Um, Good, softens it. I'm, see, I'm hearing some really good stuff. So let me show you what it does. Um, it does this. 
you have your plastic pipe, and all that purple stuff is, is it's a primer. I mean, I'm sorry, it is a primer. Um, it's a solvent for the wood, for the vinyl. I'm sorry, excuse, let me try that again. You have your vinyl, and you put this primer on there, and it actually swells it because it's a solvent, okay? So at the surface, you're actually opening up the structure, creating holes. The solvent goes into these little holes, and then it evaporates. You notice the smell of that stuff, that's the solvent. It's typically like methyl, methyl ethyl ketone, I think, for PVC. So you're creating space, okay? Then what's the second step that you apply when, for the PVC system? The cement, right? And the cement is actually, if you read the label, it's more solvent and it's lower molecular weight. Um, vinyl chloride, so it's the same polymer that you're adding in to fill that space, okay? So you've just created space, you add your cement in, and it's actually the same exact polymer as that white vinyl, okay? It's just really small pieces of it. So it's a solvent weld, is what we call it, solvent welding. Another, the name that we give this theory um, of adhesion is diffusion, okay? So the first theory was mechanical interact, the second theory is diffusion. So that just means one thing kind of works its way into another on a really small scale. Um, does that make sense to everybody, the diffusion theory? So the PVC is a great example. Um, if we were to think about wood, there's a really interesting theory that happens. This is more for composite boards, though, because of the types of resins. Um, you can actually, if you imagine that wood has some structure, let's imagine wood is the black part. It's got some fixed structure. Um, if you apply a resin, that could diffuse into the holes of wood, not just the voids though, actually get into the holes in the cells themselves. That's what we're talking about with diffusion, getting into the holes of the cells. And if it can get into those tiny places in the wood cells and react, then you can form a network within the wood network. And that's a really great um, situation for bonding. Again, that's, that's what we see for some of the um, thermoset resins for composite manufacture. We have evidence that those do make those interpenetrating networks or IPNs. So we're not talking about getting into those big voids up there on the left. We're talking about with diffusion, getting into each individual wood cell and the spaces between uh, the, the wood itself, okay? Does that make sense to everybody? So mechanical interlock was talking about getting into the big holes. Diffusion is talking about getting into some of these tiny, tiny spaces, like in between some of these fibers, okay? Or in between some of these fibers, okay? So it's a much, much smaller scale. Okay, so we've got two down, mechanical interlock and diffusion. Third one is covalent bonding. This is actually forming a chemical bond between what you're binding to and your adhesive. So that would be ideal if you could do that. What's the problem with that? <laughs> Chemists could probably do it for you, but you would have to pay for it. Okay, really expensive to do this. So there are systems that do work for this, but not practical for um, commodity applications like, um, like our wood is. So here's an example of a paint that can do this. It has an organosilane that forms a chemical bridge. Okay, so it's a covalent bond. It's actually bonded together by chemistry. And Keith told me not to do too much chemistry, so I won't, but this is the one system for, um, for wood resins, MDI, which is an isocyanate. Um, this is the only commercial wood resin that might actually form covalent bonds, and it's very limited under certain conditions only. I won't go into the chemistry of that, although it's really interesting. You, I'll, you can trust me on that, right? <laughs> I actually do think it's really interesting. <laughs> um, okay, so electrostatic theory is the fourth. Um, so if I go back just one moment for the covalent theory, very limited application to wood, okay? How about electrostatic theory? Is this gonna have a lot of application for wood? Yes or no? I see votes for yes. Okay, votes for no. A lot of no votes, come on. <laughs> um, it depends, okay, it depends. So this is an example of an electrostatic theory. Positive and negative charges attract. Okay, so what is this guy? Salt, right, table salt, NaCl, okay, table salt. So we won't go into all the chemistry. The main thing with electrostatics, positives and negatives interact, that's it. 
does wood build up a lot of charge? Not, it can in certain cases, but it's pretty temporary when it does. Wood is thought of as a pretty good insulator. So generally this theory doesn't apply very well to wood. However, interestingly, you guys probably use this every day on a wood-based product when you use a laser printer. Um, if you ever thought about how a laser printer works, it's in electrostatics. Um, there's actually, it's really pretty cool. Um, if you, you can Google this to learn more, but basically you have this, um, the drum in the middle and you apply a charge to it. And then you have your laser right across the surface of that drum, your image. And when the laser writes on it, it switches the charge in that region, okay? The toner then gets a charge on it and it jumps to the places where the laser just worked. And then you're able to apply that to paper really quickly and then use heat to fuse it to get it to stay on the paper. Okay, so all of that is charge in electrostatics when you, every single time you print a piece of paper. It's pretty interesting that that, um, that chemistry is what's working for you for laser printing. But other than that, really very little application to wood bonding because it's not very permanent. To have good adhesion, you guys want things that are permanent. So the last one um, that we see is called secondary interactions. And there's, we talk about this a lot in my class, but I actually have to give them a lot of um, background so that they understand what these secondary interactions are chemically. Um, but you guys are familiar with hydrogen bonding, right? Hydrogen bonding is one of the big secondary interactions that we talk about. And what it is, is it's very similar to electrostatics, but the charges are much smaller and they're a little bit more fluctuating in the compound. So with my students, I give them a, kind of their chemical glasses to put on as they look at structures and we think about what the chemistry of these different groups are and how they can develop these tiny charges. That little delta symbol just means it's a really small um, charge that develops. So even in water, something very simple like water, you have tiny charges that develop. And the way that those charges interact with other charges explains natural behavior in an amazing way. So I get my students to really think about this and they, then they start understanding things in nature, things in um, chemistry. It really starts to make a lot of sense if you just have some few basic um, chemical principles under your belt. So this just shows an adhesive okay, in a region in contact with the surface. And all that we're talking about are these tiny little charges holding things together between the adhesive and the surface, okay? This is the dominant theory for wood adhesion, for how wood glues work, is these tiny little charges that develop and how they attract to the wood surface, okay? Mechanical interlock also occurs. Um, diffusion also occurs. So there's no single theory that explains wood adhesion, but those are our biggies. Secondary interactions, again, those tiny little charges and how they interact, because you have a lot of them. If you imagine a really long polymer, you've got tons and tons and tons of these little charges interacting with a surface of wood that has tons and tons and tons of little charges, okay? So you can imagine almost like all these little micro magnets kind of interacting with each other. That's how most commercial wood adhesives work. Um, mechanical interlock and diffusion to some extent. Okay, so you can think about these when, you're, when you encounter an adhesion problem, you can be thinking about ways that you might tweak your process, either your wood or your adhesive, um, to get better bonding, okay? Any questions on these theories of adhesion? Why are they called theories? Yeah, good question, why are they called theories? Um, there's, there's a lot of talk about different <laughs> ideas for why these things work and, and how do you test an adhesive? How do you guys test your adhesive? What do you do? Break it. Break it, that's right. So once you've broken it, you can't really study what it was anymore. So you've fundamentally changed it. Um, so these are theories. And actually a lot of people are trying to build models that would account for every single factor and then predict a lifetime performance. You know, for wood, we may not have um, life and death ramifications of adhesion, but the airplane industry does, you know, so they need to be thinking about fatigue and cyclic loading and trying to predict lifetimes of bonded joints and things like that. So a lot of people are working on that. Question? What is the best surface preparation? You, we talked about in you know, the surface should be somewhat porous, so you've got a brace of plenty, heat, mm -hmm. knife cut. What, what, what's the best 
preparation? The question is, what's the best preparation for your surface? Uh, I think it probably depends highly on the application, highly on the wood that you've got, um, and the money that you've got, <laughs> right? So there's, it, I think that that's a great question to think about. And it's something that maybe you guys should each be thinking about for your operation, for your adhesive that you're using, the economics of your operation, um, the timing, how quickly do you need to get stuff laid up and consolidated? What kind of open times can you tolerate? All of these things, you know, you could model the costs associated with. What if you got a new adhesive where you could just not have to worry about open time anymore, something like that? Well then, with that time savings, you may be w willing to invest in something that gives you a better machine surface. Um, so these are things to think about in your operation for improving cost and performance of your adhesives. Good. Other questions? Okay, I do want to just mention um, one of my colleagues is doing a little bit of work on this. And he wasn't able to come today, so he gave me a couple slides, just wanted to show you. You know, most of the resins that we talk about are petrochemical based, so you're getting stuff from petroleum typically, although there's some starch products um, that are more natural. But this is my colleague Jeff Ketchmark. He was scheduled to be here on the program, but he had a class um, conflict, so he, asked, he just gave me a few slides to show you, just to tell you that he's trying to develop adhesives from natural materials, from sugars, um, from chitin, which Chitin is actually a really cool material. It's, this, it's like the hard shells of insects and um, crustaceans in the ocean. Um, so you know that nice hard shell? He's, that's, tons of that are wasted every year. There's no real good applications for it. So he's trying to develop adhesives from that, uh, which are much more natural. What's that? Yeah. Chitin. Yes. Well, they have the shell of them is the chitin. The, the things that adhere to them are usually like a protein that those are excreting. Yeah, that's a, so some people are actually making adhesives from um, marine organisms. Columbia Force products, you guys probably know, there's like a soy-based formulation that's been really popular. And the cross-linking for that was inspired by looking at mussels and barnacles and how they foul surfaces. So I just wanted to show you, I don't want to spend a lot of detail on this, um, just to tell you that you know, he's, he's working hard to develop these blends of proprietary um, blends of these different compounds. And he really wanted me to bring a, a piece with me, but their latest formulation um, didn't dry properly. So you can see he's coating it on a paper sheet. You see that nice coating that he's able to achieve. And the game with this stuff is um, improving the wet strength. So you can get pretty good dry strength, but getting the wet strength that you need is really difficult. And um, he's showing here that he can, he has a couple things that can do that, but they're still working to improve um, some of the other formulations. The other thing is penetration time for coating applications. You want something that will resist a liquid penetrating through a surface. Um, so again, I don't want to spend too much time on that. Just wanted you to be aware that People at Penn State are trying to develop new green adhesives, and you know, if you're interested, Jeff would love to talk with you more about that. He's he's a great guy, very creative, um, very interested in solving industrial problems. So, so um, thank you guys so much for coming today. Yeah, I hope, I hope you have a great time on the tour. I I'm, I'm, unfortunately can't come, but um, I really enjoyed coming to speak with you. If, there's, if you're interested in other topics for future meetings, you know, there's people at Penn State working on all kinds of aspects of wood science. Um, if there's other things about adhesives that you're interested in, like chalking, how does that happen? Um, be happy to come to another time if, you, if you'd want to have me. But um, have a good time on your tour. Thanks again for your attention.